the next session is is called creating awareness amongst regulators and legislators um, because we think that you know this is an important part of the jigsaw and and certainly in the first session first panel session we we discussed a lot about the the critical role that regulation plays in in making the changes that we need um, and um, but it, you know we're hoping to explore the degree to which you know public awareness can help drive this this uh, awareness amongst regulators and legislators. So we're hoping that some of our panel will talk about this. Um, we've got three um, great panelists um, in this session, um, and we've tried to we've we've tried to kind of uh, not be too Eurocentric. And so we've got a panelist um, from Asia, a panelist from Europe, and a panelist from the States, because the regulatory environment is different in all those countries and it's really useful to compare notes in what works um, and the the three speakers we we have uh, Barami Sayo who's uh, from uh, the Humane Society uh, International Korea um, and where she she focuses she's a senior policy manager and she's focusing on legislative legislative campaigns and policy changes for animal welfare so she's definitely the right person to have in the room she was a lush prize judge way back in 2014 as well um, we also have elizabeth baker um, who's the regulatory policy director of the pcrm physicians committee for responsible medicine in the states um, she's a, America, a member of California Bar Association, American Society for Cellular and Toxic Computational Toxicology, the Society of Toxicology, and the European Society for Alternatives to Animal Testing. Um, so clearly, some great skill there. And finally, as Rebecca mentioned, we have Tilly Metz, the MEP, um, European Member of Parliament for the Greens since 2018 who's the chair of the European Parliament's Animals in Science Working Group of the Intergroup and uh, of the Intergroup on the Welfare and Conservation of Animals. God, there are some complicated titles in people's jobs, aren't there? So as, as Rebecca said, Tilly can't be with us today because of parliamentary business, but she's recorded this video for us. I am happy to be able to contribute to the 2021 Lash Prize Conference. When it comes to the goal of ending animal testing, I think the question of the importance of awareness is a crucial one. Especially when it comes to the people who legislate, regulate and decide where public funding goes. We all want safe products effective medication and high environmental protection. Most people agree that animals should be protected from suffering and that animal testing should be avoided where possible. But many legislators and regulators included still believe we need animal testing to guarantee this thing. This is partially due to tradition, to an old way of thinking, but also to a lack of awareness of the potential of alternatives of animal testing. The truth is that many, many other methods are already possible or under development. And the more we experiment and invest into alternatives to animal testing, the faster the phase out will happen. It is important to say that for legislators like myself, who are aware of the potential of alternatives, the goal is not to have less testing or less research. We want different testing, new research, even better, more efficient testing and more human relevant results without the use of animals. I think in this approach, we have the full support of the citizens. And actually, as shown events such as this one, of industry stakeholders as well. I think the EU ban on cosmetic is a great example of how things can go wrong because of a lack of awareness and consistency on the side of the legislators and regulators. Everyone knows that there is a ban on animal testing for ingredients in cosmetics, but not many consumers know that this is still happening in the EU and has been happening since the official ban entered into force in 2013. The reason for this anomaly is an inconsistency with the EU legislation on chemicals. 
The tests on animals are not performed to meet the requirements of the EU cosmetic regulation, but for workers' safety under the EU regulation on chemicals. So the cosmetics industry is still required to test on animal in some cases, even in the EU, but the industry itself wants to leave animal testing behind for good. Companies have adapted to the ban and are committed to the transition to alternatives to animal testing. And of course, we know that the EU citizens don't want cosmetics ingredients to be animal tested for any regulation. Actually, there is an ongoing European citizen initiative to save the cosmetic ban. I hope that the petition will increase public awareness and send legislators a clear signal that the ban needs to be respected. One of the questions I was asked to address was whether legislators and regulators simply follow the public. On the subject of animal testing, I really wish it was, because a big majority of citizens worldwide want the end of animal testing. But in reality, the progress in legislation and in laboratories is much slower and way behind public opinion. Some legislators and regulators are afraid to change the status quo. They are afraid of the complexity of the legislation that needs to be revised. Or they use economic interest or the independence of researchers as excuses not to make any big changes. That's why I still think that, we, that public pressure is a very powerful tool when it comes to ending animal testing. The more citizens speak up for animals and against animal testing, the faster the change will happen also in politics. Talking about politics, in September of this year, the European Parliament adopted an ambitious resolution on the phasing out of the use of animals. We had 667 out of 705 MEPs voting in favour of the resolution. A small working group of members of the European Parliament, which I chaired, worked for over a year to get this resolution. We met with many stakeholders who provided scientific and or regulatory input. The resolution was not perfect, but still a strong call to action. Parliament made it clear that the continuation of the slow progress we have seen so far will not do for EU citizens. In the resolution, the potential of the NAMS is clearly recognized, be it in research or in regulatory testing. We ask for more funding, training and awareness raising on non-animal methods. With this resolution, we hope to shake things up a little and to encourage member states, the Commission, and relevant EU agencies to step up the ambition and to increase cooperation. The resolution's main purpose was to call for an action plan to speed up the phase out of the use of animals in science. Currently, we are still waiting for the Commission's response to this call to action from the elected representatives of the EU citizens. So in the next months, public pressure will be more important than ever. We need the public, we need the scientists, but also the companies to get loud, to get involved, to show that there is really a demand for progress. One thing is clear, moving away from animal testing for good will require a collective effort. We need continuous pressure and support from the general public, campaigners, and very important from scientists and companies who are on board with this transition. The resolution of the European Parliament recognizes the collective challenge of the mission at hand. For the drafting of a possible action plan, the resolution calls for the establishment of a high-level inter-service task force, which would involve all relevant public and private agencies and stakeholders. 
For me, this collective and transparent approach should also be adopted for the implementation and monitoring of the action plan. Again, thank you for having me and my apologies for not being there in person today. And thank you for all your commitments. Thanks. Thank you for the kind introduction, Rob. And um, I would also like to thank Lost Press team for organizing this uh, great conference and also inviting me as a, for this panel to discuss creating awareness amongst the regulators and the legislators. And so my, I titled my slides, um, Creating Awareness for Political Impact. And to be able to create, create political impact, we need not only creating awareness amongst the regulators and legislators, the role of public engagement and awareness is very important as well. So when I um, got this panel a title, um, I wrote down some questions that um, some questions questions that I would ask myself to be able to plan or just to think through what sort of um, plans I can um, uh, draw out. So these are including is creating awareness amongst the regulators and the legislators enough? And how do we do it? What approaches do we, do we need? And also what else do we need to do to be able to see the change? And I won't be able to provide all the answers today, but hopefully sharing my experiences uh, for the past 14 years around these questions can help some of you. And also hopefully it can create some uh, discussion opportunities later on. So starting with this creating awareness among regulators, less, less, re regulators and the legislators enough. Of course, it is important to work with the government and the lawmakers to be able to change and also maybe make a new law and policy so that ultimately we can end the animal testing and provide the science-based alternatives. But this is not singular and it will really have to be supported by different aspects. And as we heard from the first, first session on public awareness, creating general consensus is very important so that the regulators and the lawmakers are aware that there are public demand and interest. But also it's important to engage with the scientific communi communities because they provide the solutions for human relevant science. But then how do we do it? What approaches do we use to be able to create this awareness? So um, with the government and the lawmakers, I'm not sure if it's the similar case in the EU, but I learned that many people agree that animal testing is cruel, but not many people actually know that there are replacement methods available. And for example, what is organ ownership? Uh, what is human cell-based test? And including staff at the um, political offices as well, they don't know that they know that alternatives are alternatives to the world, but then they actually don't know what these mean and also how this can impact on animal welfare and public health, which is a very important aspect. So for this reason, we provided recently provided a place where a politician uh, physically visited the research lab so that she could. Um, actually see the human cell-based method and the researcher who demonstrated the OECD validated method says that this simple method is actually more accurate and with a higher pre uh, toxicity pre uh, prediction rate for human skins. And with this simple method, not only scientific, but also we don't need to fill this room with a full of rabbits causing suffering. And also, it's important to engage with multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary dialogues. I mean, it sounds already complex, like multi-something, multi-something, I know. But um, who's developing human relevant approaches? And also, af after developing these approaches, who are the ones using these ones then? And also, why do we, what do we need to, to be able to move forward, developing and using these new approaches? So they're including these aspects to be and, and have a discussion with regulators and legislators are very important because, because then they can be um, uh, considered to be able to uh, make regulatory changes. But then what about other, um, other aspects like public awareness? Um, 
again, we've seen great examples in the first session. But when it comes to public engagement, I learned that it's, it works best when we use animal images. But then I think it's also important that we create kind of a social norm or social awareness that there are alternatives and these are the areas that we need more investment and that's the scientific way that we need to push forward. And with the scientific communities, um, we organized like different forums where we could invite researchers actually developing the, the, the new method without using animals. And these are from hospitals, universities, research labs, and uh, we sit them together with the scientists and the regulators and legislators so that these can be reflected, reflected when we create legislative basis, uh, build regulatory support, and secure funding for research and development and infrastructure. So just to share an example in safety assessment, um, like EU REACH, we also have Korea REACH um, called KREACH, and it came into effect in 2015. And we started engaging with the government and um, chemical companies and um, other industry people. And I never forget hearing this, someone um, telling me that I'm not going to talk to you anymore because you're not a toxicologist. You know nothing about toxicity testing replacement. And after that, um, for the past years, we were working on public awareness uh, by engaging with the media, launching petition, organized political discussions, and also we were able to secure some strong political support as well. And also we hosted the expert forums with toxicologists and the chemical industries together so that again these people um, these methods and these non animal methods can be actually used in the industry. And with that, um, carriage amend amendment and the KBPR biocide regulation amendment were um, passed, promoting alternative methods in 2018 and 2020, respectively. But then our work didn't end there because we have to make sure that these are going to be implemented. And so in uh, 2021, actually, I'm very happy to share this positive update that um, a couple of months ago, the Ministry of Environment announced the new vision, 2030 Chemical Safety and Animal Welfare. And their goal is to use more than 60% of chemical information um, generated using new approach methodologies by 2030. That's great, but we will have to push on until we reach 100% and make sure that they make sure that this is achieved. So just going back to the some of the questions I addressed earlier, is creating awareness amongst the regulators and legislators enough? Yes, it is very important, but also engaging with those who influence these people needs to go together, and that's including public and the scientific communities. So how do we do it then? What approaches should we use? I mean, this is a very complex <laughs> question and difficult to answer. And there are problems, obviously, with animal testing, not only ethically, but also scientifically as well. But also we need, we need to emphasize that there are solutions. And um, when we say replacement, what does actually this mean? And then creating awareness, awareness around this with regulators and legislators will be very important. And what else do we need to do to be able to see the change? So we have the same goals, but different approaches for different interest groups. And it requires a lot of research and analysis to be able to identify different strat strategies. So basically, my answer is there are a lot of work involved. <laughs> but um, just to finally, um, just to finalize, I think um, resilience can be useful um, because many of you, most of you have experienced the challenges, difficulties um, when you work on um, this area, this very complex to, um, subject. And so um, it has to be resilient. And for that reason, this kind of a conference is very helpful and inspirational as well to be able to uh, meet with other people, have uh, hear from different uh, perspectives and backgrounds. And so I hope that um, my talk contributed in, in that regard. So with that, thank you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hello everyone from San Diego in the United States. 
Uh, many thanks to Lush Prize and staff for putting together this awesome conference. I always love attending your events. Um, and thanks for inviting me to share my perspective from the US on the role that legislators and regulators play in, in, in ending animal testing. Um, I really think both of them play a huge role. That's the short answer. It's a huge role and, and we'll get into some of the details around that. But the reason that it's such a big role is because as um, my fellow presenters have said, um, they make the policies that guide testing, they provide research funding, etc. So they're two extremely powerful groups. Um, even though both legislators and regulators make policy, I see their roles as quite different because one very much influences the other and one is quite dependent on the public and on the voters while um, the other is not as much. So I've, I'm going to, I don't have any slides for you. I'm just going to divide my thoughts up um, in terms of legislators and then regulators. In the United States, our federal legislature or our Congress, it's made up of a Senate and a House of Representatives. And the senators and the representatives, they work for us, the people. They run for office, they're voted in by their constituents. Um, these are the individuals that live in the state or the part of the state that the congressional member represents. They are accountable to the voters because they want to get voted back in. So they, are, um, they very much value the issues that matter to their constituents. So it's very important for constituents to use their voice with regards to animal experimentation. The interests of businesses located within the area that they represent are also of high value to congressional members. Now, um, some of the activities that, that our legislators do, they pass the laws, of course, they provide funding to agencies, and they, a, lo a lot of their action will set the agenda for much of the regulator and agency work. So it's very important to have them on the side of replacement. Over the past several years, PCRM and other groups have made a lot of progress working with legislators. And I think we're really fortunate to have a lot of members of Congress that are willing to take action for animals on animal experiments. And you see it um, in, you see a lot of interest on the side of um, the more conservative legislators as well as the more progressive or liberal. Um, since this is all about public awareness and engagement, I wanted to share some strategies that really are open to all for engaging legislators. The way that we engage is through lobbying, and I know that word lobbying can be really scary to, uh, to you if you haven't started doing anything like that, but really what it means is relationship building. And it's meeting with your member of Congress, asking your member of Congress to take action with regard to animal testing. And anyone can do it. You do not have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to have some other um, big credentials. Everybody can do this. You reach out to the office that represents you and you ask for a meeting. And you need to be prepared to demonstrate why they should care. Well, many of them will care because you have asked for the meeting. You are. Um, you are one of their voters, and if you're not one of their voters, if you're, an, a, for example, an NGO, well, then you can bring in members or constituents from their area to help you get the meeting and to talk about the importance of ending animal tests along with whatever specific action requests that you have for them. So we very frequently will bring in our um, our supporters of PCRM to have meetings with us. We also will bring in companies. So you have a lot of companies that are developing human specific technologies. Um, if they can't come, then you certainly will talk about how industry in their area are affected, um, as well as um, maybe some universities in the area that are doing relevant work as well. Briefings are a really good way to build your relationship with legislators. They, they help you expand your reach in my, um, in my experience. So you pick your topic, you will send out emails, and, and this is maybe something that's more for um, organizations to do than an individual, but there's nothing to say that an individual can't do this. 
um, but you would send out your invitations, you you walk around to different offices and, and invite them to your event, you host your event, you, you provide the education, and you have an action that you're requesting of Congress. And these are great because they I have found every briefing that we hold, we reach offices that I didn't have on my radar, that I didn't know would be interested in ending animal testing. Congressional inquiries are another way that you can build your relationship with um, legislators to, to help get them acting for animals, to end animal experiments. Um, these are where Congress will reach out to, say, um, regulators directly. Cong we have worked with Congress on a number of different um, inquiries where we will say, okay, this is a problem. We want to get FDA's formal position on this. We need some more information, but we also have an ask around it. Will you work with us to contact the agency? And then you provide the background information to the legislator. But there are also a lot of members of Congress themselves that just care about the, the issue of animal testing. So you might not even have to be a constituent rep, um, who they represent. If they are one that very much cares about animal testing, um, then they're likely to take a meeting with you and, and understand what it is that they can do to help um, to help move away from animal experiments. And we are, we are seeing just a growing number of, of offices like this within the United States Congress. There have been a lot of successes in our legislature recently over the past few years. This is a really quick talk, so I'm just gonna share a couple. Um, if you heard Ariane Ish's great talk from Encompass um, just before this panel, she mentioned um, chemical reform, and this is something that, this is a law that was passed in um, 2016. It marked the first law in the US to mandate agency and industry use and develop non-animal methods. It was a result of 10 years of lobbying by ARIA, by others at PCRM, other animal protection groups, um, congressional champions, definitely bringing in public support along the way. Um, there's also, um, every year, the, our Congress works on appropriations, and this is how they um, allocate some funding to different agencies. And with the, with the funding, there can be um, direction or requests of federal agencies. And just last year, Congress passed some appropriations report language that told the it directed the fda to update its regulations to remove any references to animal testing from the regulatory framework so that was a big deal um, as i said there's so much more i can't get into it now but happy to talk about things later but the group rise for animals in the um in the united states they keep a list of um it's called the legislative roundup and it um, it's just kind of legislation around animal experiments. It shows you what has been introduced. It gives you a little summary of it and where it is in the legislative process. So you can sign up to get those updates. And I think it's really nice to just see things condensed in one place. So there's been a lot of success in Congress. There's a lot more to do and um, certainly public um, because of the, because Congress value so much what their voters um, what their voters want there's a big role for um, for making change for animals and labs using those relationships I'm gonna move on quickly to regulators from my perspective and experience working with regulators it's much different than the legislators regulators are working for the federal agencies now the the head of the agencies are nominated and confirmed but everybody else gets their job through applying working their way through the agency so they have less influence from the public because they're not voted in by the public but different age and i would also say that there are different agencies that maybe put more or less value on public input and it can even change um, based on issue uh, so the federal, the regulators, the federal agencies, they are given authority from Congress. 
they're taking congressional mandates and implementing them. They are receiving funding that comes with direction, as I mentioned. They're following legislation, they're responding to inquiries, but they also retain a lot of power. So they have the power of creating policies to implement legislative mandates. So they have regulations, guidance, guidelines, other policy statements that regulated industries have to follow. And because they have that authority over industry, I think it's really important that regulators provide leadership in replacement. Without it, industry is not going to have the confidence that they need in order to move away from animal experiments. Um, a few strategies for engaging regulators. It's really important, um, I have found it's really important to find common ground with your other stakeholders. And when it comes to animal testing, there's a lot of common ground with industry, with academics. Um, ethics, of course, are one. Ethics really do matter. I hear it from pharmaceutical companies, but also business decisions matter and making better business decisions are very important to, to industry. Uh, time is another thing that's, that's quite important that, uh, of course, moving as we move away from this central focus on animals, we can work on all of these issues. There's a lot going on in the US, I would say, on the regulator side. And so it's really important to support these activities. Um, I, I don't think I have time to get into them now, but I, I'll just leave with kind of one final thought to, to sum up my thoughts here. There have been a lot of advances in the science around human specific approaches, but there are a lot of non-scientific factors like our policies that are requiring the use of animals that are going to keep animal experimentation going until they change. It's our regulators and our legislators that have the, the power to make these changes. And so we need them to use that power to accelerate the, the move away from animal studies toward uh, methods that can better protect human health and animals. And I do think the public will pay, play a very key role in pushing both the legislators and the regulators to some extent um, towards taking that action. And that's all for me. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. You, you mentioned, you know, creating events to get people along to and all this kind of stuff. And I'm conscious that we, you know, we're, we're kind of a year and a half into a pandemic. And I just wanted to kind of ask the, the three of you, particularly whether you've found that that has been a, you know, has it, has it stalled progress? Has it helped progress? Has it made no difference? So I, I don't know what, what just, just a kind of reflection on, on what, what kind of the experience of COVID has done in trying to kind of do your awareness raising work. Okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> COVID has just required a big shift, right? So um, we all needed to find a way to continue to be effective for animals with the changes before us. And I think at first we were very concerned that not being able to have that face-to-face -face interaction with other scientists, with the legislators, with the regulators would be a big problem. I have been so impressed and I'm quite proud of, of my colleagues for the work that they have been able to do during this time that really, as I reflect, I, I don't think that we've lost out. We've just shifted. So things have changed. So, for example, um, you know, we we were doing a lot on the Hill. Thankfully, we had a lot of relationships already, and we were able to keep those up through Zoom and Teams, <laughs> these, these like virtual face-to-face, -face, these were lifesavers. What we, what we did miss out on, I think, with engaging legislators is um, the newer relationships. We somehow, as I said, I've been so impressed with our team, they have been, they've been able to create new ones. We've still had a ton going on this year. Um, there have been a couple of things like we wanted to bring a, um, we wanted to bring 
a lot of our members to the hill for meetings and that just um that didn't quite translate the way that that we wanted it to and so we're very much looking forward to being able to do that but i think we are also going to have um we're going to have a virtual hill day in the future and so i will invite um you anyone who is a member of pcrm will see that and i will invite you to join and i think those types of things are great for public awareness because they um they kind of give you the skills to lobby so that you can take you can use them on the issue of animal experimentation and then you can use them for any other issues that that are interesting to you and i know that's a little bit of a tangent but it came up into my mind as i'm thinking about how we had to shift um and so you know I, I think I kind of rambled on a lot there because it's this thing I'm constantly thinking about and I at times I might feel oh I just wish we could just go in there and have this meeting and and get this stuff done but I'm reminded that we've done all sorts of other things in that time that have been really effective that we um, likely wouldn't have done if we weren't forced to think about how we were going to do things differently. Right. Okay, thanks for that. Barami, do you want to, what, what's it like in kind of Korea trying to do this stuff? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Rob. And um, it would be a lie if I said COVID didn't, <laughs> didn't affect our work. Um, it definitely did. And uh, for example, like working with the regulators, especially Korean government, they don't actually use Zoom. So um, it wasn't like we were able to uh, uh, propose the virtual Zoom meetings. And it kind of, it, I think it kind of like um, created another obviously barrier to be to stop um, having a face-to-face -face meeting. And obviously it's a whole different dynamic when you actually have a face-to-face -face conversation versus just email exchanges. So that, 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 that it was quite frustrating and also they were quite restrictive in terms of accepting the external visitors so um, we had to kind of really monitor the COVID situation and the number of cases going up and down and with the, the legislators uh, as well that uh, because the whole parliament building they kind of um, uh, really restricted how many people can uh, enter the, the building so otherwise we would have been going to the political offices uh, not, um, uh, every other day so that we can build the connections but then um, like Elizabeth said luckily we had some um, uh, uh, some relationships built already um, just that it was um, for example when we had to organize some political forums we had to minimize the number of people we can um, have together in the same place and um, and with COVID we were we kind of like sort of about doing a, like a video recording and then uploading it on a YouTube channel or social channels so that in that way um, although it was like um, technical difficulties involved we were able to actually share our forums with wider public like more number of viewers so that was um i guess one of the advantages advantages came out of um organizing the online forums and and um uh, i can keep going on and on but uh it, it um but but I think that there are always a way to just kind of like go around and just to make sure that we can find the right opportunities and the approaches to be able to continue because COVID cannot stop our work. Oh, for sure. Okay, Lu Louisa, have the, what's the perspective from, from inside Europe? How, how have you managed to keep going? Has it been a problem? Yeah, um, I think that COVID was first and foremost, a wake up call on the relationship between humans and other animals. And, and, uh, and that brought um, the issue of animal welfare to, uh, to the table. Um, so from my perspective, and I know it's very biased because I'm within this, uh, this context, it really, it really opened up the dialogue. And it, al al it also opened up the dialogue on animal testing because there's a, there was a lot also in the media in the beginning, in the outbreak of this, of this pandemic about animal testing and new animal models that were being developed and how researchers were testing on animals trying to find a cure. And that very quickly um, broadened to, um, to, to a dialogue um, on, on science, on different models, and even on the scientific value of animal experimentation and of non-animal uh, non models. 
So in the end, we ended up with this resolution in the European Parliament with, uh, with, with a great um, support on almost a unanimous vote uh, on a very difficult issue for, uh, for, for politicians in general, or at least I thought. Uh, so I think that um, it's bringing the issues to the table on animal testing and other and other areas where um, where uh, where we have a, a relationship with animals, and that was uh, that was that was positive. Uh, it would be good if we would have that without a pandemic. Uh, but nonetheless, I I do think it um, it will bring it will bring uh, further progress also to our area. Yeah, we we had that we had a session on on kind of COVID and and its relation to animal testing at our conference last year, and those kind of themes came up. Um, and we heard from Thomas Hart, amongst others, who have a lot to say on that subject. We also had one in the intergroup of the European Parliament, also with Thomas Hart. <laughs> there you go; he gets everywhere. So um, the, the, I'm going to have a look at some of the questions that are in the Q and A box now. Um, and there's a question about the first one here it says what role uh, can environmental NGOs play in promoting adoption of alternatives to animal testing amongst legislators what organizations of this type are engaged in this area and and this is an issue that we've come across at lush prize and that often environmental NGOs are pushing in the in the other direction and almost trying to encourage increased use of animals because of their concerns primarily over toxicity and I just want Perhaps we could get you to all, all to reflect on that one. Should we go back in the reverse order now, so as, so as to be fair? Louisa, do you want to comment on that first? And we'll... Yes, yes, it's a it's a very pertinent uh, question, and uh, and indeed, um, as uh, animal welfare organization, and I know the others also have the same the same um, uh, perspective that sometimes. Um, the environmental NGOs are pushing for more animal tests instead of uh, of, uh, of of the NAMs um, or solutions uh, away from animal testing, and I think that's also a little bit our fault. Um, there was uh, one thing that came up in the in the in the presentations that I, I really enjoyed. So say, thank you so much for Ami and Elizabeth for sharing. They were very comprehensive on. What the role is um, with uh, with regulators and legislators, and one one very important aspect with without which we cannot move forward is building confidence, and um, we still have a lot of work to do on building the confidence of regulators on these non-animal approaches, and we have also to do that work with uh, with all stakeholders, including with the environmental NGOs. So I think that they have not been sufficiently part of this uh, of this dialogue, and it is a question of including them and starting an open discussion. No, that's that, no, that's a really really interesting point. Barami, do you want to uh, kind of make a comment about environmental camp NGOs and where they yes, are? Really um... Thank you for the question. And uh, we actually really tried hard to engage with environmental groups uh, when we were working on um, carriage and um, other animal testing issues. And um, the interest was there, but then the kind of um, the challenges and difficulties that we faced in Korea was that because there is not much awareness around alternative methods, like what other um, human-based toxicity testing can be used instead of animal testing, which is more accurate than animal models. Um, because of this kind of lack of general awareness, um, and uh, it was difficult to get the environmental NGOs attention. They kind of tried like just to join in the messaging, um, public messaging together, but then because it requires some sort of like technical kind of information to be able to understand what sort of um, non-animal method can be uh, used for environmental protection for public health. Um, it was uh, was uh, challenging, and and but I think it would be great if um, environmental sectors can come together as well because I understand that in other countries um, they often uh, promote more animal testing, but um, I found it's not the case here at least. But then the issue is that there is not much awareness around that we there are better toxicity testing available and and that's the kind of challenges that we are trying to overcome here okay great and elizabeth do you, what, what's it like in the states with this issue 
Well, I want to start with, I appreciated that um, Tilly actually mentioned this briefly in her presentation where she said that we want to be clear, we're not trying to have less testing, we're trying to have better testing. And so um, we, I fully support that. And I, we need, I think we really need to link to form a link between these calls for safer chemicals and avoidance of animal testing. Um, it has been a challenge in, in the US and we, we've got to find some common ground. And I, I, think, um, I think right now we're all racking our brains trying to figure out what that is and how we can build those relationships because we've got to work together if we're going to, if we're going to address this issue. And, and um, I, I very much like what the other panelists said about focusing on better science um, and better outcomes. Okay, uh, no, that, that's all good. Um, we go, we got more questions coming in, which is great. Um, I'm going to go to the there's one uh, down there on on the, the pharmaceutical industry in all this. Um, uh, you know, so it's, it says, is there a desire or pressure from the pharmaceutical industry to change regulation in the US? I mean, I guess we could ask the same questions of, of EU and, and Korea too, but I'll start with you, Elizabeth, just on that one. Um, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, so I the short answer is yes. I, I but it de certainly it depends on the company. Some companies are more willing to engage, and some are a little bit more conservative. But um, one of the things that we have tried to do over the past handful of years is build those relationships with industry scientists, where we are um, working together on some of these issues and. Um, making sure that the conversation is being had, that we have to change the policy. It's not just about the science. Um, you can have the best science, but if policies aren't allowing for the use of that science, then then nothing's going to change. And so um, we have had, we've absolutely um, made this a priority for our work. We have had um, some different companies have met with us and higher officials at the Food and Drug Administration to talk about these issues of we need these regulations to change. Um, we've also met with, we've, we've joined different pharmaceutical companies in educating Congress as well. So kind of both of these issues we've talked about today, the legislators and Congress, we have worked alongside industry in trying to make changes at those levels. And yes, with with there's some push now on legislation, but also on regulation and guidance, uh, because it's all coming back to um, what Louisa said, that confidence building. And if the regulatory framework does not allow for use of non-animal methods, then companies do not have the confidence to use them. Okay, no, sure. Uh, Barami, do you want to Kind of, do you want to comment on on the pharmacy role of pharmaceutical industry and all this from a Korean perspective? Yes, um, thank you for the question. And it's one area we definitely need to work to work together with the pharmaceutical companies to be able to add pressure um, for regulatory changes. Um, I spoke to some of the um, scientists working at hospital and universities developing um, organ chip models or chip models or NPS. But um, we discussed like, uh, the involve involvement of Korean pharmaceutical companies, but then um, it's not quite widespread knowledge uh, for those companies to, um, to acknowledge that there are better approaches rather than uh, keep relying on animal models. So it's one area that we definitely need to work more on. And, but, um, and also I spoke to some of the um, uh, senior members from the pharmaceutical companies, but then um, they were talking about computer-based approaches because it can be more effective and faster and can be more accurate. But then they were also having the internal struggles because um, those people on the very top um, of the whole structure, um, those are the ones uh, um, deciding the, the uh, uh, making the decisions and being able to actively engage in th this sort of um, paradigm shift. But then um, because 
animal models have been used to just for so many years. So it's a difficult to kind of a shift their mindset and just move on to something new. And I understand that it can be quite scary and especially they don't want to um, risk anything. Um, so, so it's definitely one area that uh, we, we need to just keep pushing on and um, try to find the better uh, communication channels. Right, and, and Louisa, do you, do you want to comment on what, what the role of pharmaceutical companies in all this in Europe? Sure. Uh, I don't know if you followed the, the last uh, intergroup meeting last, uh, last week uh, that we had to discuss um, this, uh, this resolution. Tilly also mentioned that in her, in her talk. And one of the panelists was, uh, was from uh, the European Federation of uh, pharmaceutical industries and associations, FPA, um, and uh, and we were we were very happy with uh, with uh, with their role also in this um, in the, in this dialogue of uh, on on moving forward. They are supportive of an action plan. Um, what this action plan needs to include then is the, um, is the mechanisms to also facilitate the change because industry industry as as in, in the scientific community in biomedical uh, sciences um, it's not all at the same level so we have some companies that are very advanced and making a lot of investments on innovation without the use of animals and have made enormous progress on the reduction on the number of animals they used but all the others are are not um, following the same path and have a more conservative way of working still so uh, again putting forward these mechanisms uh, so policies and actions that can help and facilitate uh, the change within the industry is uh, is extremely important, and their involvement in that dialogue is crucial. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks for that. Well, we've ticked off environmental groups and we've ticked off pharmaceutical companies. Um, what is there left for us to talk about? Lots. So uh, there's a question very specifically for Louisa down the bottom. Uh, it says now that um, European Parliament has passed this resolution in support of non-animal research what can the public and ngos do to ensure that this actually results in positive action and is not just forgotten can you just before you do just remind us what what the resolution said as it were or the key things about it uh, yes. so the resolution asks for an action plan to phase out the use of animals in uh, in uh, in in research in regulatory testing and in education it asks for more investment on education and training, more funding on non animal approaches, uh, building confidence and awareness, of course, and uh, reduction objectives. We need objectives. And uh, I can come back to that a little bit later. It asks for coordination. We need a level, a high level of coordination also to achieve change. We are asking for uh, coordination, not only among uh, different directors general from the European Commission, but also between the member states, um, engaging also then with all stakeholders, because member states need to be on board for us to, uh, to achieve to achieve change. Collaboration, 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 and funding, funding, funding are really two very important uh, uh, words in this, uh, in this action plan, and that's why they have to be said three times. Um, involvement of private sector, uh, scientists, and society is also a must. How can we uh, how can we move uh, move forward? Well, we have we have two different scenarios. In a in an ideal world, uh, the European Commission uh, could reply that they put an excellent action plan in, in place. But at this stage, uh, this is not uh, really a given. So why we we would expect that they list uh, uh, all the initiatives that I that they are holding and some planning to promote uh, the three R's and an animal science. Uh, for the near future and hopefully leave the door open for further discussion because continuing with the same level of uncoordinated actions um, and with no concrete objectives will, uh, will, uh, will not deliver any significant change for, for animals. So we're trying to replace a system, not just a couple of, uh, of methods. And so what, could, uh, what can NGOs do and, uh, and the public 
first and foremost, sign the ACI, support the ACI, share the ACI, make sure that you, family, friends, colleagues, and people that you have no clue who they are, sign this ECI. This ECI is not just asking for, for, um, for, uh, for a, strengthen, a strengthening of the ban on cosmetics. It's also asking uh, uh, to ensure that no new tests on animals are required in, uh, in safety assessment legislation. And also it's requesting the commission to put forward a strategy to phase out the use of animals. So this is an extremely piece to uh, show public support uh, towards this, um, this, uh, this action plan. And, um, and so this is from the public's uh, side, but then it will be also very, very important to get the support from member states. Some countries are already developing uh, their own strategy to phase out animal experiments, but it's far from being an easy task also at national level. So you can ask your government to support this action plan. And it's, um, it's an action plan that it's not only looking at animal welfare issues, it's an opportunity for growth, for, for being in the forefront of innovation worldwide for delivering better, better health and, and protection for humans and, uh, and the environment. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. And, um, and, uh, and that's it. I think I spoke of dialogue and how important it is also for everyone to be part of the dialogue, including the NGOs, of course, in the public. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of take this question and frame it slightly differently for, for Barami and, and uh, Elizabeth. So, I mean, it's a, um, I mean, we've no, so this is in Europe, we, we've got this kind of notion of, of a big forward plan that everyone aims at. Is, have you been thinking about that in Korea, um, about that kind of approach? I mean, in a sense, it's almost like modeling carbon targets, isn't it? And doing this kind of kind of getting a long term plan and aiming, getting everyone in the same place. So have you been considering a similar approach and, and uh, doing something on that subject in Korea? Um, we are always keeping an eye on what's happening in EU and US. And uh, the example that um, Luisa shared, it's been something that we've been uh, following up and, um, and, and um, it's kind of a side note, but I really hope that it goes well. But in Korea, um, we don't have such thing like, a, it's, it's obviously a different political system we have here. So um, because we realize that we need more like holistic approaches to be able to tackle not only the um, across all industry areas as well, not only cosmetics, but toxicology area safety testing and pharmaceuticals, medical devices. And we really want that all kind of relevant government involved and all the um, most of the uh, industry sectors involved so that they can be part to be able to actually uptake and adopt uh, those non-animal methods. And to be able to do so, we actually um, worked with uh, politician and um, it took three years to be able to develop the new legislation and uh, this is a whole new piece of legislation and um, pro promotion of alternatives to animal testing for development and dissemination and use and so it's been introduced to the to the national assembly and um it well, if passed then uh, we will be asking the all government to come together and really provide the proactive funding and policy um, uh, system so that uh, this can support the the, the de developers and also make sure that it can be implemented. So uh, it's something that it's, it's different to EU, but it's something kind of a similar approach that we are taking here at the moment. And do you and would you have like in the in the way that we, we have a simple ask of the of the EU uh, listeners to this, which is kind of sign the citizens initiative? Do you have a simple ask of your of your Korean uh, viewers? Uh, what, what thing would you ask the general public in Korea to do? one thing it's, in, it's interesting that you ask that because we actually teamed up with the last korea um to set up the petition page where korean uh, public can uh, come and visit the uh, last korea website and there is a direct link where people can sign in so that uh, we are going to use the petition to be able to really kind of uh, put, a put the pressure on the government and also the other politicians as well so thank you for asking and um, any any korean um, audience here, please visit lushkorea.com. 
Excellent. Okay. And Elizabeth, so yeah, I mean, the, the same question. Do you, do you know, do you, you, you're kind of looking for some grand strategy kind of thing over there in with a long, long term forward targets like in Europe, um, in the States? Yeah, I think it's really important to have a long term coordinated strategy that is working toward replacement. Um, I was thinking about this last night when I think about, okay, retirement, I could say I, I want to retire by this age, and then I might try to make that happen. But if I say I like to retire someday, it probably isn't going to happen. So you have, I think you have to have these goals so that you can redirect your efforts and your resources and, and all of these things to meet the goals. Um, in the US, we don't like the petition kind of system we don't i don't think we really have an equivalent of that and i'm not sure it would have the same type of respect that it has in the eu and i could be wrong about that and so maybe i need to think about it more but i i i don't think i'm wrong about that um but what i do think is important is that we have um some coordination among the different animal protection groups because there's so much that can be done and there's so much work to do i think it makes sense to have coordination so that we are not um we're not duplicating work um, we are kind of using our resources to the max and engaging our memberships so i think as of right now in in my head it makes the most sense for um engagement it uh, find the the NGOs that you that you like and sign up for their newsletters because that's how you can stay engaged with what they're doing um, and ask them how you can be involved. But a lot of times it's action alerts. So rather than like a, a, a big strategy for engaging the public, we all seem to use these action alerts on specific topics and the coordination is more at the like at the organizational level. But I don't know, you know, Europe is a leader in a lot of the work on animal testing. So I think it's definitely something we need to consider. Right, well, thanks. Thank you all for coming along. All, all really interesting contributions and it is fascinating to kind of compare the differences across the continents. Mm -hmm.